Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, World Tree number one from Image Comics. Now, this is the new one written by James Tynan IV with artwork by Fernando Blanco, Jordi Belair on the coloring, Aditya Bidikar on the lettering. I loved this book. Now, it was delayed a couple of weeks because there was like a misprinting or something like that, but it's finally here for everybody to be able to consume, and I will say that it's definitely worth it. The basic premise of this book is that there's something called the Undernet, Think like dark web, but something even more insidious, something even more infective, something even more intellectual or intelligible or sentient. There's some kind of force, some kind of force in the dark web and the undernet that's trying to reach, leech out, I should say, into the real world and reach into the minds of the population. And it deals with that, and it gets a little talky, some talking head moments, but then there are moments where the art just absolutely shines. I can't show you many of those scenes because they happen at the end, and I don't want them to lose the impact when you read this story. I really liked it. I thought the artwork was great. The coloring provides an atmosphere and a mood. And Aditya Bidikar on the lettering, he's just one of the best letterers in the biz and probably will be of all time because he is that freaking impressive and his work is that much a part of the book. James Tynan does a great job of introducing the characters, having them be well-rounded, having some gravity to the situation, and even providing a little bit of, of world building, if you will. World Tree number one, though, really, really liked that one. Then we got Deep Cuts issue number one. This is actually a one-shot, giant-sized comic. It is... What is the price of this comic? It is $5.99, but it's a really good deal because it's big, it's meaty, and it's a really solid story, and it's anchored by amazing artwork. So this is about a young kid. He's a musician. It's set in the 19-teens or something. Yeah, 1917 in New Orleans, and he wants to be a musician, right? But he's living this kind of like secluded kind of life. He doesn't have a lot of experience and he meets this other musician who kind of takes him under his wing and he winds up working at like a at a brothel or something like that. But it's his story. It's there's a lot of stuff here that is typical, things that are pretty tropey, things that you can easily predict that are going to happen, but this book had some soul to it. It had some nuance and I really did appreciate that and it did a great job of having a meaty, well-paced, one-and-done, self-contained story. Deep cuts, really solid, and a great cover, actually. That's a fantastic cover. Then we've got plush issue number six. This is the final issue of the Doug Wagner, um, Daniel Hilliard? Daniel Hilliard. I'm just going to go with that one because I think I do this bit every time. It's Daniel Hilliard. Um, plush number six, what a fantastic ending. This was a book that started off really solid, and it kept just ratcheting up the level of intensity, right? And then it just completely explodes and erupts here in issue number six. A very bloody, gory, satisfying conclusion to what has been a very fun gore fest with heart and charm. It's a book about cannibalistic killer uh, furries. This book did not this book delivered on my expectations. It also subverted my expectations and delivered something incredibly fun. That's plush number six. I loved it. Then we got Lovesick issue number seven. This is the conclusion of Lovesick, a book that's made me feel very awkwardly dirty and turned on and just grossed out at the same time. This is a book. It's also dealing with dark web type stuff. Um, it's about red rooms, right? And this woman, Domino, she runs this red room and she has... These men who worship her and adore her and they basically pay to be humiliated and killed and eaten on live streams. But man, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Psychologically, there's a lot of just wild stuff. There's just a lot going on in this book. And the final issue is a really solid conclusion. But the story, because the story has been kind of structurally all over the place, it's trying to bring it all together and maybe it doesn't 
fully land that 100%, but 90% is not too bad, right? So for the most part, I liked the structure of this ending, but I've enjoyed this book. It has been sensual, to say the least, but Lovesick, I'm going to miss this one, and I hope it does return, because I'd like to dive back into this world a little bit. Lovesick number seven out this week. Then we got Dead Romans issue number two. I almost didn't come back for issue uh, number two, because issue number one, I remember liking, but I remember the story is kind of confusing till you get to the end, but I did like the artwork. The artwork in this book is super solid. There is a double page spread that I absolutely have to show. Really cool, violent, interesting, barbarians versus Romans, but the story is just kind of all over the place and it doesn't really fit with the artwork or the tone and it just, just, there's something about it that just doesn't work for me. So I do like the artwork, but I'm dropping out of that one. Indigo Children, issue number two. This is an interesting uh, divergence from the first issue. So Indigo Children, I guess they're about these, these kids who had superpowers. It was all hidden away. Their memories were erased and then they're just out there in the world now. One of them, Indigo Prime, was awakened in the last issue. Now they're awakening more, and each issue seems, I mean, at least for the first two issues, or should I just say the second issue focuses on another one of these Indigo children coming to this, mo this moment of reawakening. And I liked it. I liked the artwork. I liked the flow of the story. It reads fast, but it doesn't read too fast. It's got some weight to it. It's got that gravity. It also got really good artwork. The storytelling sequentially is actually superb in this book. Indigo Children number two, I liked it. Then we got The Ambassadors, issue number three. My favorite issue of The Ambassadors yet. It's about a, it's about a single mother, right? who gets super chosen to get superpowers because the point of Mark Miller's Ambassadors is a different artist on each book as well as a different character being focused because each country gets like an ambassador or they're picking six ambassadors from across the world or something like that, right? And they're going to give them superpowers. It gives a single mom superpowers. Her and her son kind of do this like Batman and Robin gimmicky thing, but it's kind of charming and pretty fun at the same time. And Travis Cherry is Cherry, right? It's not Cherry's. I used to always say Cherist, and then I hear people say Chari. Cherie? Travis C. Travis C. Travis C. Um, doing a fantastic job. I remember this dude's artwork from the 90s. I remember the Wildcats work, even with Scott Lobdell, but the Wildcats stuff, that that was awesome. The artwork in this book is phenomenal. Story is very charming, too. Then we got Local Man, issue number three from Tim Seeley, Tony Fleece. Um, really liking Local Man so far. It's got this kind of grounded, like like small town drama kind of vibe and flow to it, but it's anchored by this history of extreme image superheroics from the 90s. And I love the way of the dichotomy of these two scenes, like the, the fact that the, the main character, the titular local man, if you will, um, how he, he is in this more mundane world of existence, but it's just as strange and complex as some of the crazy superhero elements, and I, I like the juxtaposition between those two. Local Man, though, continues to be great, and I think Tony Fleece's artwork is absolutely freaking amazing, especially Brad Simpson on the coloring. Top-notch book right there. Then we got Kaya here with issue number seven. Is this issue seven? It's issue seven of Kaya. Kaya has been an undersung, underappreciated gem every single month at the comic shops. Wes Craig, Jason Jurdy, uh, Wordy, and, and World Design. The artwork is this the main selling point of this book, but the story is so cool too. So it's about this young woman. She's like the chosen one. Then she's got like her brother or something that she's trying to protect in the last issues he got kidnapped now she is on a warpath trying to find out what's going on but the artwork is so amazing this world is so meticulously rendered with such grace and style i just am absorbed by this and jason wordy is a hell of a colorist look at jason wordy on books like agent of world then look at kaya completely different styles and approaches but it approaches the line art from the way it should be approached and through the story and accentuating or bringing out that mood jason wordy is a hell of a colorist more people need to be talking about that then we got vanish here with issue number six vanish was losing me issue five brought me back in issue six has completely lost me. I'm reading this and I'm like, even though I really liked issue number five, I just don't care. Just don't care at all. And Ryan Stegman only draws like one page in this issue. What is up with that? Not saying that Netho Diaz is bad. He's not, but like, 
This is your book, Stegman. This is your book, Stegman. And, and like, I don't know. Whatever. It's fine. Bring in some people. Fill in issues. That's fine. But it didn't have the energy visually that I have grown accustomed to in this book. And also just story-wise, it's just not grabbing me at all. Then we got Torrent issue number three. I read issue number two, and I think I left it at the shop. It didn't talk about it, but I really liked issue number two of Torrent. Um, I thought issue number one was all right. It's about a woman. She's a superhero. Um, super villains find out who she is. Um, they kill her husband, right? Now she's got a kid, and she's going on this quest for vengeance. And she has to cross some lines to get there, like some very violent lines. And that's what's going on in the books right now. So basically, her identity's known. She's F. The police can't help her. Her fellow superheroes won't really help her. So she's just a one-woman path of vengeance and it's awesome it's written by mike guggenheim with artwork by justin greenwood there are moments in here where the use of like splatter to provide like texture and, and power and impactful moments especially like where she's just blasting people away and then the emotional weight and resonance of it too you could easily look at greenwood's artwork here and be like oh it's all right it's decent but when you really look into it and how it's telling the story is incredibly good. Then we got The Scorched here with issue number 17. Got that Marks Brooks cover. It's going to be a connecting. That's really cool. The Scorched are like, everything is really heating up in The Scorched. Things are scorched in The Scorched. That was, that was really bad. Anyway, really cool stuff going on here. We got, is his name Monolith? Is that his name? I think it's Monolith. First of all, you got the earth being marked with like the mark of the beast or something like that. You got the shuttle blowing up. I think his name is Monolith. Yes, it is Monolith. Lots of new Spawn people, right? Um, but I'm really liking Scorched. There's a lot of ideas to play with here, and Sean Lewis does a great job of bringing balance to this book, even though there's a lot of chaos going on. It still has this nice thread and this buoyancy throughout that I think really helps this book maintain a sense of fun and a pleasurable read throughout. Also, the artwork by Segovia is absolutely phenomenal. I have really grown into liking his artwork a lot. Let's jump over to DC. We got Green Arrow, issue number one. A brand new Green Arrow, part of Donna DC, written by Joshua Williamson. Joshua Williamson, who left Oliver stranded in, in time and space at the end of Dark Crisis. Well, Ollie wakes up and he's very far from Earth. So you got that going on. Meanwhile, you got the Earth story where they're really establishing the sense of legacy and family. And that's something that Josh Williamson was playing around with um, in the pages of Dark Crisis. And that's what's going on right now in Superman. That's what's going on right now in Green Arrow. So you got Connor Hawk, you got Roy Harper, you got returning characters, reunited characters, lots of focus on Black Canary, some really solid artwork that I really liked. The artist of the book, who I was in, a really great recap page of who Green Arrow does. This book does exactly what an issue number one should do. Sean Zoxy. Um, art is really cool. Some nice touching moments, a really cool setup for the story, introducing you to the world of Green Arrow, the characters, and setting you up for something going on. So not every number one always works as a great jumping on point, but in this case, Williamson and company have really provided a solid jumping on point for Green Arrow. If you've ever been interested, no better time than now. Green Arrow number one from DC Comics. Then we got the Unstoppable Doom Patrol issue number two, Dennis Culver, um, Chris Burnham. This was almost pick of the week. It was pick of the week up until I read World Tree. I'll be honest with you, this book is awesome. First of all, they got a dig at the X-Men infographics. They got a major dig at that, and I like it. But it brings, continues to have this sense of weird. It has this sense of fun. It has this sense of being almost like an indie comic, even though it's DC, but it's so strange and absurd. And it has that spirit of the Morrison stuff, the Way stuff, and I'm assuming the Pollock stuff. I haven't really dived into that omnibus yet, but I definitely got to. Um, but Unstoppable Doom Patrol issue number two, Excel did a great job, did what a number two should do. It told a complete story that also kind of, they introduced the concept of the Doom Patrol in issue number one to anybody that never really read the books or only is familiar with the TV show or anything like that. Um, and in this one, they expand that out. They start referencing even more old school stuff. They start tying in some threads from the past to blend into what they're building right now for the future. They have some nice revelations. They have a complete story and they got a setup 
and really nail on the premise of this book. And the artwork by Chris Burnham is absolutely splendid. Unstoppable Doom Patrol was amazing. Then we got Detective Comics here with 1,071. Ron B continues to do what Ron B does. Tell a very romantic, tragic, operatic Batman tale. Stories being told, right? That's what's going on in the pages of Batman Detective Comics. This week in particular, Talia's explaining some stuff, some revelations. A lot of revelations in comics, like, at all times. But this is a really great-paced, lyrical book. Even though it's exposition-heavy and it's telling the story of the artwork by Ivan Reese, and there's a few other artists here, too, it just works. It works so well. It's sweeping. It's big. It's big in scale and scope and emotion. Ron V's doing a hell of a job in Detective Comics. That could be a classic run. Then we've got Action Comics here with 1,054... Yo, I really like this issue of uh, Action Comics. So we don't have Sandoval back on the... Or Sandoval is on the artwork. Nope. Sandoval's on the cover, but he's not. It's Max Rayner. So immediately I'm like, this is not the same artist. Oh man, come on. You're already changing the artist. But it works. It still has the sense of power. Still has that sense of perspective, of super perspective, where we see Superman in certain angles that make him feel bigger than life. Metallo is a legitimate threat and this metallo story comes to a conclusion but there's some really interesting setup and then you got the dan and by the way the way that the main story ends got me really excited um then you got the dan jurgens story right here lee weeks not on the artwork but dan jurgens is and it looks solid then you got a steel story back here instead of um, a Power Girl story that I thought was cool. So the Steel story was cool. There's some other, like, 90s references in that book, but I really did like it. It was action-packed. Let's jump over to Marvel. And from Marvel, we've got Darth Vader, red, white, no, black, white, and red. Darth Vader, black, white, and red. Issue number one, this is going to be a mini-series. We've seen these before. Anthology series with the idea, thematically, of the colors being black, white, and red. Okay, they've done Wolverine, they've done Elektra, they've done Carnage, they've done Deadpool, and why not Darth Vader, right? So let's do it. Um, I actually really did, for the most part, like this first issue. I thought it was pretty solid. There's a main anchor story by Jason Aaron and Leonard Kirk. Yeah, Leonard Kirk, and, and it's all right. They don't actually utilize the black, white, and red so much in here, like at least to the way, I mean, it happens, they, they eventually do more, but it just... I don't know, it's an alright story, but it's going to be continued throughout the series. Then you got a Peach Momoko story that was surreal, kind of scary, uh, and really unnerving and unsettling, and I really liked it. Her story was really dope. Like, honestly, that was my favorite of the batch. And then you get the story um, by Torun Grunbeck and Klaus Janssen. The story was okay, but Klaus Janssen's artwork, it's interesting because he's playing around with the the black and the white and the red, but also with textures and, and, and tones and stuff like that. And he's using like, appears to be digital screen tones, but he's using them in interesting ways. And he's like doing like a digital duo shade. And then he's got like, where he's fading it in and out. And there's some really interesting, like I was just staring at the artwork. You can actually see some of the, uh, like the white media feels like you can actually feel some of it on the page, the looseness of it. I don't know, I really like looking at the artwork on that. So I thought that was a pretty good buy. Then we got Clobber in Time, issue number two. Steve Scrooge doing a really fun job just telling uh, a team thing, or a, a thing team up book, right? They used to do Marvel two and one, and it's kind of got that kind of flair and vibe, but it has a lot of fun, right? So the first one, it was Hulk and, and, uh, and the thing. Now it's the thing and Wolverine. And basically the thing shows up for like a seminar and Krakoa, things go crazy. Um, him and Wolverine have to fight a bunch of, you know, metal dudes and just slash him up. You get great detailed artwork, a great sense of caricature, a great sense of action, a great sense of detail and density, and some really nice, fun, gnarly moments, and it has a great sense of humor. It's a little tongue-in-cheek. It doesn't take itself too seriously. Then we got Doctor Strange, issue number two. I really liked issue number one of the new Doctor Strange book by Jed McKay, with artwork by uh, Pascal Ferry, which I do love the artwork in this book. Now, when I was first reading, I liked issue number one. When I was reading issue number two, I was like, all right, it's okay. Like, they're trying to save the soul of this little girl. They got to go into the nightmare realm. Nightmare's been captured. Who's the real bad guy? There's some great artwork, some great composition, especially that page in particular. But midway through the book, it takes a turn, and it really does captivate me and engage me. And so far, two issues in, I'm really liking Doctor Strange. I wasn't really 
fond of Jed McKay's Strange. Wasn't really into the death of Doctor Strange, but two issues in, Doctor Strange is pretty dope, and that Alex Ross cover's dope, too. Then we got Strange Academy Finals, issue number six. This is the final issue of Strange Academy, for now, because there is a tease that it will be coming back and checking the August solicitations, it says. Slight spoilers there, but a satisfying enough ending. I think that the build-up to it felt rushed at a certain point, right? But going back and rereading Strange Academy from one through today, that would be an interesting uh, exercise to see how the flow of the series is. There's some big moments here, some earned moments in here. It just feels like we really rushed into the third act, for me, of Strange Academy, phase one, whatever you want to call it. But I did enjoy it. Humberto Ramos, Scotty Young, they did 24 issues, solid. Humberto Ramos did 24 issues, solid. No filler art. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's a run. That's cool. And that's what Humberto Ramos does. Um, anyway... Strange Academy Finals, I was quite pleased with that. Then we got Hulk number 14, the end of Hulk. What a lot of just missed opportunity. Hulk had Donny Cates hot off the success of Venom and King in Black. It had Ryan Otley, right, on Hulk. It was rock and roll. It was trying to be fun. It was trying to do something different. And this book just fizzled out for me. Now we don't even have Donny on the book. Ryan Otley's doing it himself, and he's doing the best he can and the writing's getting better issue to issue, so I think it's fine. The artwork is great. There's some really nice moments in here, artistically speaking. But the story, it wraps up fine, but it just wraps up in kind of a generic, easy, convenient kind of way. But <clears throat> it's got some great artwork, big and explosive. And it just seems like Hulk, this run of Hulk's going to go down as... <clears throat> A little bit of wasted opportunity. Then we got Daredevil here with issue number 10. Got a Kevin Eastman cover on Daredevil. That's got to be a dream come true. Um, but Daredevil number 10, this is pretty solid. It's got Mark, uh, Marco Cicchetto on all of the artwork, which I think is really cool because he's been dealing with a lot of fill-in artists here and there. Um, but this one is the Avengers coming after Daredevil, which we just saw in Punisher. The Avengers go after Punisher and then they have to get in a fight. This is the same thing, but with Daredevil, and it's mostly Daredevil and Spider-Man. But you get a really badass Electric Captain America fight in here as well. So I am liking what's going on in Daredevil. Chip Zdarsky is building up to the ultimate conclusion of his run. And it's been fun, and I'm excited to see where it goes. Then we got Venom Lethal Protector issue number two. This book is not going to change your life. But if you're a fan of that old school David Michelini, Michelini, however, However you say his name. If you're a fan of that old school Lethal Protector, that 90s, early 90s era of Venom, which I am, this is a book that's going to kind of scratch some of that. You know, we never really got that Venom Silver Sable miniseries, and that's pretty much what this one is. So it's got some 90s-esque artwork to it. The coloring is all right. The coloring is what kind of pulls me out, but we got Cardiac in it, so it just is a big throwback. It's not really a good book but it's fun. Mary Jane and Black Cat, this is the conclusion finally. It feels like this book started ages ago because Dark Web feels like so long ago, thankfully, and it started off as a part of a tie-in to that, but now it wraps up their story, and it's all right. It's a satisfying enough conclusion. This hasn't been as good as, say, Jed McKay's other work on Black Cat. However, it does have all the Mary Jane stuff involved in it, and it was interesting, and it was fun, but I'm kind of glad that it's done, and I can move on to other things. Then we've got from Dark Horse, Blue Book, issue number three, I'm liking this. First of all, I love Michael Avon Oming's artwork. I know a lot of people don't, but I really like that style. And I really like the monochromatic approach that's being taken in Blue Book. It's all blue. But this is the story of Betty and Barney Hill. And it's just basically a matter-of-fact documentation of it, illustrated by Michael Avon Oming. Um, that's what it is. But now we're getting into Barney's, like hypnotic recollections of what happened. I liked it. I thought the setup was cool. The backup story has some really cool artwork, and it's trying to like tie in the... French Revolution to the idea of this kid who grew up and he could never, he was always hungry and he would eat snakes and stuff or something. But I, I didn't really quite make the connection when I was reading it, but the artwork was cool. But I'm liking Blue Book. That's kind of my vibe and my jam. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Road and Lost Years, issue number three. Um, This book's all right. You know, the the duo shade, that's like real duo shade that Kevin Eastman's using there. And I, I that's really cool. I stared at that for a while. Um... The book's all right. I mean, it's not as good as The Last Ronin proper, and this is just basically a little bit of prequel to The Last Ronin. It doesn't necessarily feel necessary, but it does not overstay its welcome. And in the very beginning, the anchor or the framing story, where it's like, it's because it's a little bit sequel and a little bit prequel. It's mostly prequel, but a little bit sequel. Um, 
some really touching moments here with these like new kid turtles that I'm all here for. So Lost Years, I'm sure, is going to lead into something else. And I'm down to explore this timeline, for sure. Then we've got The Neighbors, issue number two. Love the Rosemary's Baby homage there. Um, The Neighbors, issue number two, had a good pace to it. It continued the story progression and ramping up the creepiness, and it did all that well. It was hard. When I first started reading this, I was like, what was The Neighbors about? And then as I'm reading it, I'm like, oh, I'm remembering it. So it's about this couple... Are they new in this town or something? They're dealing with anxiety. They're trying to get away from the city. They're trying to live a life, but their neighbors are weird. One of them may be a witch. They're like having one of their daughters like kissing frogs or something like that. There's the way I'm describing this book. It's not, this book is, I like the book. Um, but like the oldest daughter who already seems kind of like, just like pissy. She's like, She's like turning or something. I don't know. It's interesting to see. This is a book that didn't work so well as an individual issue, but as part of the as part of one and two. I mean, it was a good buildup of continuing momentum. It just didn't feel complete. But I liked it. And I like the artwork too. So there's something about the tone of that book I really, really like. Behold, Behemoth is here with issue number five. This was a confusing issue for me. So like Lovesick structurally was playing around where it would be telling past stuff, revealing stuff in the past while the current narrative was going and intertwining them, right? They did that in that final issue and I think it did it pretty well. Behold Behemoth does it and I'm so lost. So lost. I like this book. I love the artwork in this book. But I was so lost here at the end. I was like, what the hell's happening? I didn't know. And it kept jumping back and forth so quick. It just kind of paced wise messed me up and I just couldn't follow, but it had amazing artwork. So that's definitely one, because I don't have the issues, all of them. So guess when the trade comes out, I need to read it. Then we got Dahlia in the Dark, issue number five, the penultimate issue of our friend Joe Corallo's crime fantasy. I love the artwork in this book by Milana. There is a great sense of space and awareness of that space, the positive and the negative, and framing that right, composing it. You know, the composition's great. The storytelling is great. The dynamic parts feel dynamic, and the smaller parts feel smaller. And Joe Corallo is a really good writer because he doesn't waste space. He doesn't waste lines of dialogue. He allows the art to, to tell the story. And Joe is working with Milana and Meyer so well on this book. I think it's one of the best Joe Corallo books I've ever read. And I've pretty much liked every Joe Corallo book I've read. Dahlia in the Dark, number five from Mad Cave Studios. By the Horns, Dark Earth, issue number eight. Love this book. So glad it came back. Uh, category zero's out too, but our shop was shorted. And I think I accidentally deleted the email that I had the digital file in, but I'm not sure. But I'll try to get to that next week. But By the Horns, Dark Earth, issue number eight. Loved it. I love this book. Jason Murr does a great job with the artwork, with the designs of all of the characters. For a book that starts very simply as this woman's lover was killed by unicorns, and so now she's on a mission of revenge to kill all the unicorns, and becomes this sprawling, giant fantasy epic that has such an immense scale and scope and it continues to widen that introducing new characters reintroducing characters fleshing out characters and having an ending i swear y'all do not do this to me anyway by the horns is awesome cannot wait to see that book continue then we got dark stalkers felicia issue number one you know what i'm not ashamed to admit it I like Darkstalkers. I love Darkstalkers. I've never been ashamed to admit that. I also like butts. I'm not ashamed to admit that either. So a Darkstalkers comic with Felicia on it and a butt, I'm going to check it out. I'm at least going to check it out. The book itself was just all right. The artwork was fine. It was decent enough, but there's this annoying quality to it where the gutters are thin and they're black and it like not in that page, but like in pages like this, the gutters are thin and they're black and it led to like a kind of a wonky reading experience. There's some nice layouts, but like for instance, this looks like it should read like this, but I don't think it did. No, it doesn't. Oh, I see now they're not lined up right. Anyway, there's some nice artwork. There's some butts. There's some Dark Stalkers references and uh, the, the werewolf character. What is it? John Talbane or something like that. He's in it. I don't know why I'm talking so long about this book. It was fine. It was fine. 
I wanted it to be better. Because I really, really like that cover. But that does not get the cover of the week. But that is close to the cover of the week. But I will give the cover of the week to a book that I don't read. Uh, I already showed off two of this gentleman's covers today. Daredevil and Last Ronin. Kevin Eastman for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 139. The cover of the week. And why? We've seen Kevin Eastman draw the turtles so many times, right? But there's something about this composition. There's something about the coloring. And there's something about the actual figure work of the turtles. Where they each have a clear, distinct, designed, like, personality. You have all the turtles there. This is really cool. I would love to have, like, a print of this. Like, big. That is a hell of an image. So that's... Going to be the cover of the week, so that's what I read, that's what I thought about it. So to recap, Darkstalkers, Felicia, it's got butts. Then we got By the Horns, Dark Earth, that book is awesome. Expanding that world, Dahlia in the Dark, a super solid penultimate issue. Behold Behemoth, a rather confusing ending for me. The Neighbors continues momentum, but doesn't feel fully complete as an issue. The Last Ronin doesn't feel necessary, but it still has elements of fun to it, as well as tragedy. Blue Book, I'm really into the subject matter, so I like that one. Mary Jane and Black Cat, I'm kind of glad that wrapped up, but it was fun. Venom, Lethal Protector, if you're a fan of that silly Venom stuff, like me, for sure. Daredevil, liking it, building up to the end, the climax of Sadarsky's run. Hulk number 14, a very disappointing ending to what has, to me, been a disappointing series that never lived up to its full potential. Amazing artwork, but it just never connected, and it feels like it kind of had to close out short. Strange Academy Finals felt like maybe we rushed a little bit into Act 3. However, it still had a very ballin' ending. Doctor Strange, number two, continues some solid momentum from the first issue. Clobberin' times, just having a good fun clobberin' fun time. Darth Vader, black, white, and red. Really liked that one. The Peach Momoko bit in particular. Action Comics, that was awesome. The main story in particular. Detective Comics, operatic Batman, tragic and romantic. Unstoppable Doom Patrol, this book is strange, weird, fun, interesting. It's exactly what a Doom Patrol book should be. Green Arrow, a very solid uh, start and a great jumping on point. The Scorched, Sean Lewis maintaining that balance. Torrent maintaining intensity and riveting that up. Then we got Vanish. I think Vanish has lost my interest. My interest has vanished. So bad. Kaya continues to be one of the best undersung books out there on the shelves. Local Man continues to impress. The Ambassadors, best issue of that series yet. Indigo Children's Sword. Uh, Dead Romans kind of lost me a little bit. Love Sick made me feel weird, but a satisfying conclusion. Plush was probably the best conclusion of anything that concluded this week. Then we got Deep Cuts, a really great self-contained once and done, almost a graphic novel type story. And then World Tree number one. Yes, a new one from James Tynan. I will once again say, yes, it's worth picking up because it's pretty solid. Great idea, great artwork, really cool cover there. David Aja. Um, that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Join us over at patreon.com slash PCP if you want to help support the channel. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading. Station. Pop, pop. Boom! <laughs>